I am, uh, thank you for coming, and uh, I am Nior uh, from H4 Codes, the company behind uh, Cloud MQP, and I work as a developer advocate there. And here with me is my colleague, uh, Erika. Yeah, so I also work as a developer, Cloud MQP. Um, yeah, and I think you all know kind of what Cloud MQP is, so we don't have to go through that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and today we're going to talk to you about uh, RabbitMQ and uh, WebSockets. So we reflected on a couple of questions, uh, like why combine RabbitMQ with WebSockets? How do you combine RabbitMQ with WebSockets? What are the performance differences? And uh, these are some of the, the questions we hope, we, we hope you find answers to by the end of our presentation. And because this talk is mostly about connecting browser-based applications to RabbitMQ, we're going to try to put everything in the context of the web. Uh, and so we'll start from the very beginning, the evolution of the web. In its initial phase, the web was static. You know, you go to a website and the same content is shown to every user. But then with the rise of databases, server-side scripting, uh, websites started showing content to users based on the actions they initiate, and uh, this would mark the beginning of the dynamic web. But you see, right now the web has evolved so much with the rise of chat applications, gaming applications, the need for real-time interaction on the web has grown. <clears throat> and this is pretty much where the web is from a user interaction perspective. But that's not the entire story, because if you think about it, the web is multifaceted. So there are other areas of the web that has witnessed significant trans uh, transformations over the years. For example, uh, before I get to this, how we build our complex web applications these days has changed. We don't build them as monoliths. We build them as symphony of small services or microservices as we like to call them. And these services talk to each other, right? So this new web landscape demands not just real-time interaction on the web, but a robust and scalable way to get the services to communicate. And uh, this is where RabbitMQ comes in, so let's talk about it. So while on the one hand, uh, WebSocket simplifies real-time communication, RabbitMQ on the other hand ensures more robust and scalable architecture. So uh, in other words, uh, a real-time web application that is built on a robust and scalable architecture is what you have when you bring RabbitMQ on and WebSockets together. But this begs the question, right, how do you bring RabbitMQ and, and WebSockets together? So RabbitMQ has so two native techniques for our supporting RabbitMQ on WebSockets. But before we get into that, we just thought it'd be nice if we review the protocols that kind of power these techniques. Storm, MQTT, and MQP. I know this is, our, you're probably already very familiar with this, so we're going to just do a quick review. Now, Storm as a protocol was born out of the desire to build something really simple, a bare bones protocol that could be easily implemented and un un understood. And one of Storm's defining feature is its text-based nature. So when you look at a Storm frame, it's pretty much like HTTP. So when you look at a Storm frame, they're usually human readable. So for example, if you publish a message, let's say hello world to a queue a name test, the un underlying Storm frame would look like this. You know, very readable. Uh, Essentially, Storm just aims to be uh, aims to provide a very limited set of APIs uh, that covers the basics of messaging quite well. Now, MQTT, MQTT was designed to have features tailored for constrained environments. So we're talking about devices with limited power, bandwidth, and unreliable connections. Now, just in case you're wondering what shaped the design decision for this. Early on, MQTT was used to monitor oil pipelines. So without going into the details, the monitoring devices used and the environments in which they were used had these exact limitations as well. Even though uh, MQTT has found new use cases, like in the IoT space, this was what 
this was the initial drive behind the MQTT. Now, uh, MQP, relatively, MQP is a more complete protocol in terms of features. Uh, for example, it has a more sophisticated routing mechanism, which kind of makes it more flexible. You could use it in different messaging scenarios. And, uh, but then, as you see, with more power comes, okay, I feel like I'm using this wrongly, but it, MQP's uh, feature richness kind of makes it uh, a relatively more complex messaging protocol. Uh, now that we, we have like the basics of this protocol, we can kind of move on to see how you can combine web circuits with RabbitMQ. Like I said, uh, MQP, uh, RabbitMQ supports two techniques out of the box. You have the WebStorm plugin and our uh, WebMQTT plugin. So uh, with the WebStorm plugin, when you enable it, basically what it does is it exposes a web circuit endpoint on your RabbitMQ node, and this web circuit endpoint could accept our Storm frames that are wrapped in web circuit packets. Uh, but now the question is, what happens when RabbitMQ gets this storm frames that are wrapped in web circuit packets? Let's try to visualize that. Now, this is a very simplified flow. Step one, a, a browser client would send storm frames to your RabbitMQ uh, node over web circuits. Uh, on reaching RabbitMQ, the web storm plugin would unpack uh, the storm frames from the web circuit packets. Uh, step three, it then hands this to the MQTT plugin for processing. Now, if the server needs to send a response back to the client, kind of the reverse happens from step four. It would uh, hand over the storm frames to the web storm plugin, which would then wrap it in web circuit packets and forward it to the browser client. Uh, and that's that for web storm. Now, web MQTT is not so different from what we've seen with WebStorm, only that now it's MQTT focused, right? So if you enable this plugin to, uh, you get a web circuit endpoint exposed that could accept MQTT frames wrapped in web circuit packets. Uh, and on reaching RabbitMQ, this is the flow to so, uh, a browser would uh, send, a browser-based application would send MQTT frames wrapped in web circuit packets to your RabbitMQ node. Uh, and then on reaching RabbitMQ, the web MQTT plugin would uh, unpack the MQTT frames from the web circuit packets. It then hands it over to the MQTT plugin. And again, if the server needs to send the response back to the client, the reverse happens. Uh, but there's a gap. Uh, so at CloudMQP, we are, are kind of recognize that uh, what RabbitMQ supports MQTT and Stomp of a web circuit, it doesn't cater for our MQP in the same manner. So we created the WebSocket TCP relay. Uh, this is like a quick summary. My colleague Erica will touch on the motiv motivation behind uh, the WebSocket TCP relay later. But traditionally at Cloud MQP, we've used the WebSocket TCP relay to enable um, AMQP of our WebSockets. So uh, it comes with all our dedicated instances on Cloud MQP. But then it's open sourced. So if you Google a web circuit TCP relay, you see it on GitHub. So because it's open source, you could install it on, on your server uh, with apt, or you could uh, run it in, in Docker. So after all this, right, the AMQP, MQTT, and uh, we were curious as to how the differences in these protocols translate into our performance differences as well. And so we did some benchmarking of WebStomp, WebMQTT, and WebMQP. Now I will let Erika share our findings with you. Okay, so we know that, for example, uh, MQTT is a very lightweight uh, protocol and should be more resource efficient than the others, but uh, how does this really convert when used over web sockets in RabbitMQ? Uh, so we kind of wondered, uh, does the presumptions we have about these protocols uh, like equalize the reality uh, when using uh, web sockets in RabbitMQ? 
And so to explore that, we uh, wanted to know how many connections these uh, protocols could handle and how much resources uh, they needed for this. And to summarize, uh, I will talk a bit about which protocol over WebSockets uh, you should use in which scenarios, um, based on what we know about uh, the protocols from before, but also from this kind of benchmarking we have done. So to explore the performance of this protocols over web sockets, we wanted to test how many number of connections affected the CPU and memory usage, but we also looked at uh, the number of airline processes that were uh, used. We created multiple connections, all creating one queue to consume from and pu publish messages to, and we published messages uh, with an interval of like 50 to 60 seconds to simulate, simulate some kind of real-world example or scenario. Uh, we used multiple servers as load generators, meaning they were to create multiple connections, each against the servers running RabbitMQ and either had the WebStorm plugin enabled or WebMQTT or used the WebSocket TCP relay for WebMQP. And we used uh, multiple servers as load generators to speed up the process uh, since creation of connection takes some time, but also to be able to spread out the, the load on the servers. Um, and also we wanted to focus on uh, the CPU when the connections already were alive and ready to communicate because uh, we figured it's not a really real-world scenario that have, you would create a lot of connections at the same time. So the RabbitMQ servers we tested against were of two different virtual servers, one with the two C CPUs and four gigabytes of memory, and one with the same number of CPUs but eight gigabytes of memory, so just a little memory difference between them. So this is the maximum number of connections that we could create before the servers run out of uh, resources. Um, and this is the smaller server of four gigabytes of memory. And it was definitely the, the memory that was the bottleneck here. Um, and this is the connections we could create before the server started to swap memory. So it's not like the server totally broke down, but it started to use, yeah, to stay alive. Uh, but also keep in mind that this is not only connections, uh, it's also the equal amount of queues, as I said, and also some messages. And as one could expect, WebMQTT could handle more connections than WebStomp and WebMQTT. WebMQP, um, so WebMQTT around 13,000, the others 9 and 10,000 respectively. And next thing we did was using servers uh, with more memory, so 8, eight gigabytes of memory, uh, but not testing the maximum number of connections. Instead, we fixed the number of connections to 15,000 and 20,000. And not surpri surprisingly here either, uh, MQTT uh, could handle more connections with uh, less memory usage. But as you see on the CPU, it's uh, not really lower than for the other protocols. And as you can see, WebMQP performed really well. Um, uh, good to know is that we didn't mix with the receive buffer and send buffer, uh, which should probably in like be set dependent on your special use case since it will affect the memory usage much. Um, so as I said, we also looked at how many Erlang processes uh, that were created. And WebMQTT creates one Erlang processes per connection, while WebMQP created a lot more processes and WebStomp even more. So this is probably one of the things that affects um, 
the, the memory usage a lot in the CPU. So um, we still see that many of our customers use WebStomp or MQT, WebMQTT, even though uh, they have no real use case for it. Uh, for example, they, they mostly use MQP for all the other connections or the other communication. And it may be due to that uh, the WebSocket is peer relay, uh, wasn't around when they initially started using WebSockets in RabbitMQ, or of course that um, the WebSocket TCP relay or WebMQP isn't a plugin in RabbitMQ as the other ones. And uh, uh, here's a little when when should you use uh, the ones? Uh, so. We would say that the only reason to use WebStomp would be if you use Stomp in the rest of your system or you, you don't use RabbitMQ communication at all in the other cases, but that isn't really, that's a very rarely use case. Uh, but yeah, and WebMQTT you should probably use when you have a real a typical MQTT example uh, when you need it to be really lightweight. But in most cases, WebMQP, uh, since, it's, since it has a bit better performance than WebStomp, for example, it, uh, it should definitely be enough to use. And especially if you're using MQP in all your other systems, it, it's easier to use uh, WebMQP. Okay, so that was what we had. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Thanks a lot. Uh, we can do one quick question or maybe more. We'll see. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Very nice presentation. I was wondering whether the benchmark was made with the native MQTT version of RabbitMQ or previous, like 3.12 or 3.11? It was 3.12.4. Okay, so what? With native. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. So, yeah. Next question. All right. Thank you very much.